the travesty of my remarks about nothing coming from nothing. Let me take that as an example. What I wanted to show is that science is circumspect in the way that it approaches the great questions of being. Okay, it looks around, and if you're a naive looker around, a philosopher, a theologian, a gardener, a farmer, you will see a huge amount of energy in the universe, and you will marvel at God's bounty. But then, as a scientist, you think again, and you say, yes, I can measure the amount of energy in the universe. I won't just lie back and think about it. I will measure it, because once I put numbers to, it, to ideas, they become testable and verifiable. And to, to determine the energy of the universe, the th first thing I do is to weigh it. So I weigh the mass, I determine the mass of a galaxy, and then I multiply it by the square of the speed of light. And through E equals mc squared, I get the energy that that galaxy represents. I do it for this galaxy, that galaxy, this galaxy. Every galaxy in the universe, not just the ones we can see. And I get a colossal value. And I lie back and wonder at God's munificence. And then I say, but I've forgotten something. Which is the gravitational attraction between galaxies. And whenever you have two attracting bodies, they lower their energy. And if you take the gravitational attraction of this galaxy with that one, it lowers that first sum we got a little bit. Then this galaxy with that one, this galaxy with that one, this galaxy with that one. And the signs are, and we're not completely certain about this, because we don't, do not jump to conclusions in science. We are circumspect, imaginative, and honest. We find that that gravitational attraction reduces that original huge energy we had to zero. In other words, God's munificence was zero. And you don't need a God if the God isn't going to give you anything. What science does is to simplify the questions that need to be answered. It doesn't say there was nothing originally, there's nothing now. What it does is to simplify the question that needs to be asked. We're moving cautiously, imaginatively, and reliably to understanding the incipients of the universe by seeing, by identifying what questions truly have to be answered. There is nothing here, I will concede that, but it's an extremely interesting form of nothing. There was nothing originally, there is nothing here now, but it's through whatever event took place at the inception of the universe, it became an interesting form of nothing, which seems to be something. It may be metaphysical, and it may sound stupid, but what I'm doing is identifying the question that needs to be answered, not just sitting back in awe and saying, look at the universe, fantastic job, it obviously needed someone really rather special to do it. Let's review those three arguments that I presented on behalf of theism in light of Professor Dawkins' critique. First, the cosmological argument. I presented philosophical and scientific evidence in support of the premise that the universe began to exist. In his last speech, I understood Professor Dawkins simply to assert that the arguments against an infinite regress are no good, but I heard no refutation of my examples that I gave to illustrate this, nor any reason as to why the reasoning was invalid. It needs to be understood here that the mathematical existence of the infinite is not in question. I'm talking about whether or not an actually infinite number of things can exist in reality. In their textbook, uh, Mathematics and the Imagination, Edward Kastner and James Newman comment with regard to the, in, the infinite, its existence in any form is a matter of considerable doubt. The infinite certainly does not exist in the same sense that we say there are fish in the sea. Existence in the mathematical sense is wholly different from the existence of objects in the physical world. 
And I'm arguing that it's absurd metaphysically for there to be an actually infinite number of real objects, and I don't think Professor Atkins has dealt with my arguments. Secondly, with respect to the evidence for the beginning of the universe, again, he asserted there's no evidence scientifically for the beginning, but I presented the evidence in my opening speech. The bord guth vilenkin theorem, which is independent of any physical description of the early universe, uh, requires a past space-time boundary. Here's what Alex Vilenkin himself says in his book, Many Worlds in One. He says, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now, Dr. Atkins is a reasonable man, and therefore he should be convinced by the borg guth vilenkin theorem and face this problem of a cosmic beginning. And in fact, as I say in his book, he does so. He argues that the way you get around the problem is by saying that nothing exists, um, that there was nothing then and there is nothing now, but I didn't hear a response to my refutation of that, that the argument for that based on positive and negative energy is misguided, and secondly, that the conclusion is absurd because it's self-contradictory and also because his own existence at least is undeniable. So it seems to me that we have good grounds for thinking the universe has a cause which is beginningless, uncaused, changeless, timeless, immaterial, enormously powerful, and personal. First, have we seen any good arguments for theism? Well, it seems to me that we certainly have. First, we had the cosmological argument based on the origin of the universe. I presented evidence, scientific and philosophical, that the universe began to exist, and that has not been refuted. I then argued that if the universe began to exist, there had to be a transcendent cause of the universe. And here, all Professor Atkins can say is that science is edging toward the answers. Ladies and gentlemen, science is not edging toward explaining how being can come out of non-being. That is a philosophical, metaphysical question, not a physical question. What science is edging toward is answering the question, did the universe have a beginning, or is the universe infinite in the past? And all of the evidence that I am familiar with is on the side of the scale that said the universe is finite in the past. It is not past eternal. The borg guth vilenkin theorem requires the finitude of the universe in the past. I know of no evidence whatsoever that the universe has existed from infinity. Moreover, there's nothing in science that would explain how something can come into being out of nothing. Indeed, as I showed, Science presupposes the principle that out of nothing, nothing comes. Otherwise, the utter, uh, there would be utter chaos in the scientific enterprise. You wouldn't be able to explain anything scientifically because you could just say it came into being out of nothing. So I think we have good grounds for believing in a transcendent cause of the universe endowed with the attributes I suggested. Um, I thought one very interesting point that Professor Atkins uh, made against your uh, cosmological argument, Bill, was this point about um, you can't invoke causality in trying to explain why there is a universe, why the universe began and so on, because causal laws depend upon there being a universe in existence, which it describes, and so you can't invoke causal laws when there is no universe being assumed. Yeah, this is a mistake in, sometimes Professor Atkins speaks as though there were a time when there was nothing, including no causality, but that's philosophically incoherent. You see? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. It, it's, it's not true that there was a time when there was nothing. The point is that time itself had a beginning yeah. before which there wasn't anything. When we say there was nothing before the universe began, we don't mean there was something before it, and it was nothing. What we mean is there wasn't anything before it. The universe came into being, and the question is, does that require a transcendent cause, or can the universe just pop into being without a cause? And it seems to me that causality is a metaphysical principle, not just a sort of law of gravity or law of thermodynamics, 
which governs being as being, and being doesn't come from non-being. Being only comes from being. Well, presumably you would think that causality can only be a scientific principle because philosophy is not the way to go here. So you, you can only invoke causality in a scientific sense from your viewpoint, is that correct? Well, absolutely. I mean, I mean uh, philosophical arguments about there being a metaphysics before there was a universe seems to be absolute nonsense again. Um, you know, I, the answer to the inception of the universe will not come from sitting on our backsides and thinking about what might have happened. It will come from assembling evidence and building a model and seeing whether the model actually results in this observed universe. And when scientists have done that, philosophers will say, oh yeah, we didn't think of that. We, aren't, we see now. So philosophers will always follow where science has led. Mm, well, well, I mean... <laughs> That, that's so naive. I, I mean, that is really a naive view of science and of philosophy. Ph science is replete with philosophical assumptions uh, that make science possible. And as, that's why I said before, the person who thinks that he isn't doing philosophy or has no need of philosophy is the person who's going to not understand his own philosophical assumptions that he tacitly makes and, and therefore is uncritical of them.